Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Canon EOS R50, a tiny mirrorless model aimed at those looking to raise their game from a phone or a basic camera, or indeed anyone simply wanting one of the cutest little cameras around with the flexibility of interchangeable lenses. Announced in February 2023 and costing $679 or £789 for the body alone, or in a kit with the RFS 18-45 zoom for $799 or £899, the R50 becomes the entry-level model in the EOS R series, positioned below the R10 and sharing the same 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. As you'll discover, it can also be seen as the spiritual successor to the EOS M50, and I'll mention their differences throughout. I spent some time with the production-ready R50, and in this video, I'll show you everything that I've learned so far. Oh, and I also have a separate video about the new RFS 55-210mm telephoto zoom that was launched alongside it. In terms of size and weight, the R50 may be roughly similar to the M50 before it, but that doesn't diminish its impact in person. Both of these cameras are impressively compact, albeit with surprisingly comfortable grips that can just about accommodate a full set of fingers, as long as your hands aren't too big. Just for reference, here's the R50 on the left, with the pricier R10 on the right, sporting more controls and a slightly more advanced feature set, albeit with both sharing the same sensor and no IBIS. Which camera do you prefer the look of? I personally feel that a drive in some markets for increasingly large cameras has resulted in a lost art of miniaturization. So personally speaking, I welcome the R50 as an alternative for those who want the flexibility of a camera with interchangeable lenses, but one that can also slip into larger pockets or small bags. Again, like the M50, the R50 is available in black or white. The latter also sold in a kit with a silver zoom. Be sure to go for this kit option if you're ordering the white camera, as the matching silver lens is probably not gonna be sold separately. You can see both versions here, with almost their entire front surfaces sporting a matted, grippy texture, and that gives them a more serious look than the shinier, more toy-like appearance of the earlier M50. From the top, the R50 shares a similar layout to the M50 before it, leaving the left side free and concentrating the controls to the right. Both cameras have pop-up flashes, although the R50 switches the basic hot shoe for one of Canon's newer multifunction accessory shoes. Like the M50, the power collar is around a small mode dial, although the R50 now sports a dedicated ISO button and a more traditional finger dial, both welcome decisions in my view. Round the back, there's a similar tiny joypad with very clicky feedback, making it surprisingly easy to navigate menus despite its small size. And each direction also provides direct access to settings like the drive, autofocus and exposure. Like the M50, there's no dedicated AF on button or an AF joystick, but you can use the screen as a touchpad to adjust the autofocus area while using the viewfinder. And you're also able to customize just about any button on the body, including changing the AE lock button to metering an AF start. Most of the rear surface is occupied by the three inch screen with the same 1.62 million dot panel as the R8. And like that model, along with the M50 before it, it's side hinged and fully articulated, allowing you to flip it to face forward, twist it up and down for unusual angles, or fold it back on itself for protection. Above the screen is the electronic viewfinder, employing a 2.36 million dot OLED panel, matching the M50 and other entry level models in terms of size and resolution. Now it's not huge nor especially detailed, but it is pretty standard at this price. Behind a flap on the right side, you'll find micro HDMI and USB-C, the latter used here not just for data, but also charging or actual powered operation. I used my MacBook Pro charger on the R50 without any problems. You may recall the older M50 not only had an aging micro USB port, but it actually didn't support charging in camera. So that's a nice upgrade. Meanwhile, on the left side behind its own flap is a three and a half millimeter microphone input. So like the M50, there's no headphone jack here. If you want that, you'll need to go up to the R10. In terms of power and storage, both the battery and single card slot are found in a compartment beneath the body. The R50 is powered by the same LP E17 pack as the R8, which allowed me to record an hour and 13 minutes of 4K 25p video on a single charge, albeit across two files, as the camera has a 60 minute limit per clip. Like all EOS R cameras, the R50 sports an RF lens mount, which can take any of Canon's RF or RFS lenses. And thanks to the APS-C sensor behind them, the field of view is reduced by 1.6 times. Right now, there's no third-party native lenses in the RF mount, but you can adapt older EF DSLR lenses from any brand. 
Fingers crossed for Sigma and Tamron RF lenses sooner rather than later. The R50 kit includes the RFS 18-45mm IS STM zoom, which delivers a range equivalent to 29-72mm. It's okay for starters and provides a compact walk-around option, which also retracts when not in use to become even shorter. But I would have preferred Canon to use the same spec as the EOS M kit zoom, which started a little wider at 15mm and had a faster initial aperture of f3.5 to 63 Sadly, none of the EFM lenses are compatible with EOS R, and as you'll see later, you will want something wider for the R50 if you're using it for handheld vlogging. I'm assuming a new RFS zoom around the 10 to 20 mil range with optical stabilization will come in the future, but right now your options on the R50 are pretty limited for handheld vlogging. The RF 16 mil prime is a possibility being a tad wider than the kit zoom, but it lacks optical stabilization, so it's gonna be relying on digital compensation alone. As for imaging, the R50 shares the same 24 megapixel sensor as the R10, and neither of those cameras has built-in stabilization or IBIS for short. If you're on IBIS in Canon's range, you'll need to spend a lot more on the EOS R7 or the R6 upwards. This means to iron out any wobbles on photos, you're going to need a lens with optical image stabilization or IS for short, like the kit zoom. Although if you're filming video, you can also or alternatively apply digital stabilization, albeit at the cost of a small crop. Let's see that coverage and stabilization in action on a couple of vlogging clips using the RFS kit zoom set to 18mm f4.5. This first clip was filmed without any stabilization, so it's obviously wobble. So let's move straight onto a version using the lens optical IS only, where the view has become steadier, but still not quite smooth enough, at least for me. I think most of us would also agree that 18mm and APS-C becoming 27mm equivalent is just not wide enough for handheld vlogging. I'm way too big in the frame. Next, here's a version with the optional digital movie stabilization set to standard. This can certainly reduce wobbles, but like all digital stabilization, comes at the cost of a crop, which has made the view far too tight when handheld. You wouldn't want to watch this for long. But now for something worse. So I'll mercifully show only a few seconds with the movie stabilization set to enhanced, which again steadies the view even more, but with an even tighter crop. I'd personally say this renders the 18 to 45 kit zoom less than ideal for handheld vlogging, unless optical IS is good enough for your needs and perhaps you have longer arms than I do. The system really needs a wider RFS lens sooner rather than later. If the camera's on a tripod though, and you're able to step back to make your presentation, the R50 and kit zoom can do a fine job. In fact, for this clip, I've zoomed the lens into 45mm f6.3 for a more flattering perspective and to check the potential for a blurred background. If you're after a blurrier background at the lowest price, I'd recommend adapting the old EF 50mm f1.8 STM lens, seen in this clip with the aperture fully open to f1.8. Now, this lens may not have the fastest or the quietest focusing motors, so I'd recommend standing fairly still and using an external microphone for your audio, but there's certainly no arguing with the much shallower depth of field here. Sticking with autofocus, here's a test for still photos using the RFS 18-45 at 45mm f6.3, where you can see the racking between the bottles is swift and accurate. And for good measure, here's the same test again, but this time for video, where you can see an occasional pause before the racking starts, but the result is still accurate. Note, on the R50, you can change the racking speed for video, but unlike the higher-end models, you can't change the initial response to change. And as I swing the camera back and forth, you also see an indication of how much rolling shutter to expect in practice. Bottom line, don't swing it about too much. One of the highlights of the R50 is its autofocus subject detection, inherited mostly from the R10 with options for people, animals, which includes birds and vehicles. Now it may not include planes, trains, or a variety of other animals that are supported on the R8 and R6 too, but it is still very effective in practice. Best of all is the auto mode, which does a surprisingly good job at figuring out what kind of subject you're pointing the camera towards, be it a person, an animal, or a passing car. I tried it on Brighton Seafront, where it seamlessly switched between people jogging past, various cars driving by, and the ever-present threat of seagulls keeping an eye on the proceedings, and any donuts or chips that might be going spare. Like the R6 II and R8, you should ideally select the subject type manually for improved recognition, such as choosing people for an event or animal if you're visiting a zoo. But as a general purpose option, I do feel that Canon's now got one of the best truly automatic systems around. 
Okay, now for photo quality with the R50 capturing 24 megapixel images with up to 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. You can record in RAW with standard or compressed options, along with the choice of three low resolutions for compressed JPEGs. It's also possible to switch from JPEG to HIF if preferred. In terms of aspect ratio, the R50 can record in the native 3x2 shape or crop down to 4x3, 16x9 or 1 to 1 shapes. A true stitched panorama option is also available from the scene presets. Here's a shot I took with the R50 and the 18 to 45 kit zoomer 18 mil showing a good degree of detail and natural looking processing. But for a more formal test of resolution, I photographed my technical chart. Again, starting with the kit zoom, this time at 45 mil F8 where it delivered the best results. Taking a closer look shows a similar degree of detail to other 24 megapixel models. Although if you can fit a better quality lens, you will enjoy crisper results. For comparison, on the right, here's the result with the R50 fitted with an adapted Sigma 40mm 1.4 art lens at 5.6. It's a completely impractical option for a camera this small, but I did want to illustrate the potential difference in resolution. Moving on to noise, I photographed another chart throughout the sensitivity range, and until Adobe supports RAW files from the R50, I'm presenting JPEGs out of camera for you here, starting at 100 ISO, and going all the way up to the highest standard value of 25,600 ISO. And I'll follow that with the expanded H option of 51,200. I'd say the default noise reduction keeps the images pretty clean up to 3200 ISO with a sprinkling of noise arriving at 6400 and only a more significant drop from 12,800 onwards. I'll compare the raw dynamic range when the files are supported. The R50 may be an entry level model, but its burst speed doesn't suffer with a top rate of 12 or 15 frames per second for the electronic first curtain and fully electronic silent shutters respectively. The buffer is however quite small, so fills up quickly at these top speeds, especially for raw files. The moral, shoot JPEGs in short bursts, or if you need longer bursts, aim for the R10 or the R7. To illustrate the burst in action, here's my water splash test using the top 12 frames per second speed of the electronic first curtain shutter, where despite the modest buffer size, I've just about managed to capture the bulk of the action. And now for the same action, but shot with the electronic shutter, where you may see some of the telltale skewing of the fully electronic capture. Like most electronic shutters, you will notice some skewing effects on fast action, whether it's the subject or the camera that's in motion. So I'd only recommend using it if you absolutely need to shoot in silence, as on this camera, it doesn't really offer a significant speed difference. In my formal tests using the H plus drive mode, I confirmed both top speeds, capturing 24 large fine JPEGs in two seconds with the electronic first curtain, or 16 in just over a second using the fully electronic shutters. At this point, the R50 began stuttering as the buffer became full. If you're willing to choose the slower H speed, I managed 99 JPEGs in just over 13 seconds to work out at a speed of 7.6 frames per second. And the camera seemed happy to keep shooting. I just got bored and let go. But if you're into shooting raw, the R50 limited me to just six frames with either shutter type, whether I was using H or H plus mode. The R50 also lacks the raw burst mode of higher end models. So no pre-capture mode here either, sadly. The multiple exposure mode of higher end models has also sadly been sacrificed, but I am happy to at least see the focus bracketing option remaining, as well as its ability to stack the images in camera afterwards. A classy feature at this price point. Now for a quick look at the movie quality. The R50 can record 1080 video up to 60p or 4K up to 30p, all uncropped, oversampled and encoded with IPB compression. The maximum clip length in any of these modes is one hour, although the modest battery will run out soon after that. In my own tests, I managed a single one hour clip of 4K 25p, followed by a 13 minute clip on a single charge. Note the R10 allows longer two hour clips, although again, it's limited by the same LP E17 battery. Do remember though that the old M50 wasn't allowed to record for longer than half an hour, so these are still upgrades nonetheless. There's no C-Log for graders on the R50. For that, from Canon, you'll need to skip the R10 and step up to the R7. If you're after slow motion, the R50 offers 1080 up to 120p, encoded again with IPB, but this time without any sound and like all Canons, automatically slowed by four times. The maximum clip length in this mode becomes 15 minutes. Remember the old M50 only offered 120 frames per second at 720p. So now let's see them all in practice, starting with a clip filmed with the R50, an 18-45 kit zoomer 18mm, starting at 1080 25p, 
before switching to 4K at 25p where there's visibly greater detail. Indeed, 4K on the R50 represents a big upgrade over the earlier M50, which, lest we forget, applied a substantial extra crop when filming in 4K, and to add further insult to injury, only supported contrast autofocus with it. Now back to 1080 at 25p before switching to 1080 at 100p for comparison. And while the latter is a tad softer, I'd say it's recording a similar amount of detail. To find out for sure though, I filmed my standard resolution chart in the same three modes using the 18 to 45 kit zoom at 45mm f8. Here's 1080 at 25p on the left, 1080 at 100p in the middle, sharing a similar degree of detail I'd say, and 4K at 25p on the right, easily out resolving both as you'd hope. So in terms of autofocus, subject detection and overall quality, the R50 represents a big step up over the M50 for video, albeit still without the option of C-Log for grading or IBIS for in-body stabilization. And just before my final verdict, here's that splash test again, filmed in the 1080 100p mode, allowing a four times slowdown on my timeline. Okay, now for my wrap up. The Canon EOS R50 will delight anyone looking for a compact and affordable camera with the flexibility of interchangeable lenses. It's small but comfortable in your hands, packs excellent photo and video quality with decent autofocus, a flip screen, viewfinder, microphone input, fast albeit short bursts, and plenty of creative, not to mention guided control. Beginners and students will love it, but the R50 will equally appeal to anyone who enjoys smaller cameras, perhaps for travel or as a casual companion to a bigger model. The tiny body and position in Canon's range sadly rules out IBIS, and it's not surprising to find a smaller battery, single card slot, and a modest buffer, especially for raw shooting. Then there's the lens range, with Canon currently being the only producer of native RF lenses, and right now only three of them are designed specifically for the smaller APS-C sensors on cameras like the R50. I do hope that Canon produces more RFS lenses than it did with EFM, but in the meantime, you can at least still mount any of the full-frame RF lenses or adapt any EF DSLR lens from any brand if you like. Now, if you're not bothered about adopting Canon's latest EOS R system and simply want the most affordable EOS camera with a decent size sensor, interchangeable lenses, and a viewfinder for composition, there are a few other options to weigh up. Canon's older EOS M50 may lack usable 4K video, but squeezes in at a lower price point and with a wider kit zoom too. Then there's DSLRs like the EOS 200D, 250D or 2000D, all will undercut the R50 on price, and like the EOS M models, you may also find some bargains in the second-hand market. But if you're looking for the most affordable entry to Canon's EOS R system, the R50 has you covered, packing respectable quality and features into one of the cutest bodies around. In fact, I think the looks might sway it for me personally over the slightly more advanced R10. So tell me, has the R50 won you over, or do you have your eye on a different model? Let me know in the comments, and as always, if you find what I do useful here, I'd really appreciate you giving this video a like, and my channel a follow, both really do help, thanks. And if you love what I do, you could always treat me to a coffee, or treat yourself to a Camera Labs t-shirt, or a copy of my in-camera photography book. There's links for everything, including the latest prices in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.